Just last week, I was talking to a, a man uh, out there near the trolley station at Santee, near the Mexican border, and he claimed to be a, a prophet, and among other things. And our conversation always was at odds as a difficult argument because I kept saying, give in the book, the chapter, and the verse. Let's see how consistent you are with Scripture, all these claims that you have. He's claiming he hears all kinds of uh, information. God uh, directs him and so on. But he can't tell you where it is in the Bible. I think you have to check that out first and foremost. So, introduction to this topic. Commentary from Cornerstone Commentaries a while back. A biblical analysis of the gift of prophecy. In Romans 12, 6 and 1 Corinthians 12, 10 to 28, we read of the office and of the gift of prophecy. <clears throat> As with many issues in Scripture, there is much controversy and confusion surrounding this gift. The most common questions are, are asked, uh, such as, is this a gift for the church today? Or is this a gift that ceased with the close of the apostolic age? We need evidence, as always. Now, depending upon who or what you consult, you will get quite a different answer. There are many in the church who claim the validity of the gift of prophecy even today, even today in 2021. In Fort Collins, it goes on, the Prophecy Club regularly features prophets such as Dimitri Dudemann, who see visions of New York, San Francisco, and Los Angeles being destroyed by atomic bombs. In fact, one radio preacher identified as Brother Steyer claimed that on June 6, 1996, there will be a widespread destruction of the United States and South America because of nuclear missiles being launched against selected targets. Another man in Ohio claims that he was told by God to squat on church property. All of these men claim they received their messages from the Lord, and all these men claim to have heard from God. Of course, we know that's not the case from looking back at it from 2021. Rodman Williams wrote in the Logos Journal, God does not speak as authoritatively today as he spoke to the biblical authors. Okay, but he does continue to speak. All right, he did not stop with the close of the New Testament canon. <clears throat> Thus, he moves through and beyond the records of past witness, for he is the living God who speaks and acts among his people. Well, interesting, there's no new revelation until uh, Joel 2, chapter 2, where there will be again a reinstatement of dreams and visions and spiritual gifts of a miraculous nature. So if it's going to cease and then begin again when Christ comes again, it's got to see some time when we've had thousands of years of none ceasing. Need evidence. There are also many in the church who have concluded that the gift of prophecy is not appropriate for this age. Over 300 years ago, Westminster Assembly said this, The ordinary and perpetual officers in the church are pastors, teachers, and other church governors and deacons. Since the extraordinary officers as apostles and prophets, which Christ appointed for the edification of his church, and for the perfecting of the saints have ceased. Okay, I need your proof on that. Uh, we can see that with evidence. This is quoted in the uh, Forum of Presbyterial Church Government and Ordination of Ministers. So which is correct? To which does the scripture testify? Well, we've got the origin of the biblical gift of prophecy. God and God alone is the origin of prophecy. Deuteronomy 18.14 The nations you will dispossess, Moses writes, Listen to those who practice sorcery or divination. But as for you, Israel, the Lord your God has not permitted you to do so. Indeed, rather than listening to Satan, God's people were to listen to God. But how? And in what form? Well, God will raise up prophets from among the Israelites, Moses wrote, and he will tell them everything God commands Israel to obey. We're going all the way back to Israel, the origination of this special gift. Deuteronomy 18, 15-17, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own brothers, Jews. You must listen to him. For this is what you asked of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly, <clears throat> when you said, Let us not hear the voice of the Lord our God, nor see the great fire any more, or we will die. So the Lord said to me, Moses, What, what they say is good. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among your, their brothers. I will put my words in his mouth, and he will tell them everything I command him. If anyone does not listen to my words that the prophet speaks in my name, I myself will call him to account. 
Bible knowledge commentary, in contrast with the dark magic of Canaanite divine, diviners, witches, and spiritists, Israelites were to listen to the Lord's prophet. The Israelites could be sure that a line of prophets would follow in succession after Moses because of their original request at Horeb in Mount Sinai, that God speaks to them through Moses as a mediator. Each prophet God would raise up would be an Israelite, <clears throat> and because the true prophet would only speak the words of the Lord, the people were obligated to obey or listen to those words. The ultimate prophet is Jesus Christ. Now the ultimate prophet, like Moses, 18.15 and 18 in Deuteronomy, is Jesus Christ, the one who spoke God's words and who provides deliverance for his people. Not even Joshua could be compared to Moses, for since Moses, no prophet has risen in Israel like him. Isaiah, that's, uh, that's uh, Deuteronomy 34.10. With such power and before men in intimacy with God. However distinguished <clears throat> a future prophet's role might be in Israel, none would be like Moses until the mediator of the new covenant, Jesus Christ, came. Moses set the standard for every future prophet. <clears throat> Each prophet was to do his best to live up to the temp uh, to live up to the example of Moses until the one came who would introduce the new covenant. During the first century A.D., the official leaders of Judaism were still looking for the fulfillment of Moses' prediction. Peter said their search should have stopped with the Lord Jesus. So prophecy has its origins in Old Testament times. This is perhaps one of the most important verses we will look at when it comes to understanding the gift or office of prophet. Biblical prophecy, the office and the gift, had its origins in the Old Testament. In fact, by the New Testament, the gift of prophecy was well established. Prophecy is not a distinctly New Testament phenomenon, but one which dates back to the most ancient experiences of God's people. When we think of prophecy as an Old Testament gift, our minds immediately think of what has been called the prophetic age of the Old Testament with Isaiah, Daniel, Jeremiah, Micah, Hosea. And yet, from Deuteronomy 18, we discover... <clears throat> The prophecy had its origins in the era of Moses. In fact, Old Testament prophecy reached its point of highest glory with Moses himself. Deuteronomy 34.10 and corroborated by 2 Corinthians 3.7 and Hebrews 3.3. Now notice something very important as to the origin of prophecy. In the days before Moses, God spoke personally to the covenantal heads of the various patriarchal families, Noah, Abram, and so on. This far fatherly head would then communicate the word of God to the people entrusted to his care. And yet, when we come to the time of Moses, a paradigm shift does occur. Deuteronomy 18:15 15-17 continued, For this is what you asked of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly, when you said, Let us not hear the voice of the Lord our, our God, nor see this great fire any more, or we will die. And the Lord said to me, Moses, what is what they say is good. So, the origins, the prophecy, the Old Testament office of prophet began when God's people, Israel, requested someone to receive God's communication for them. The Old Testament office of prophet began when God's people requested a substitute for themselves. Communication with God was too awesome a thing for them. Exodus 19, 16 to 19. <clears throat> On the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast. Everyone in the camp trembled. Then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke. Pretty scary, I guess, because the Lord descended on it in fire. The smoke billowed up from it like smoke from a furnace, and the whole mountain trembled violently. And the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder. Then Moses spoke, and the voice of God answered him. And, and thus God was pleased. <clears throat> One of modern-day prophets claimed to do something like that. The gift and office of prophecy takes its shape not in the New Testament, but in the Old Testament. That's where they miss it. So let's go back to the evidence, and you have to fulfill what it says here. <clears throat> so Deuteronomy 15, 18, 15-19 again. The Lord said to me, Moses, what they say is good. <clears throat> Robertson, O. Palmer Robertson said, The small, simple voice of the prophet substituted for all the awesome signs of, of Sinai. As with almost every theological issue and in institution in the Bible, marriage, the priesthood of the believers, salvation, the sacraments, the worship, and so on, 
The gift and office of prophecy takes its shape not in the New Testament, but in the Old Testament. Again, <clears throat> by the time of the New Testament, the office of prophecy was well established. Thus, if we're going to understand the biblical gift of prophecy, we must understand in, in its origin, its original context, the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible. So what was the nature of prophecy? Prophecy is a vehicle of revelation of the word of God to man from God. Deuteronomy 18, 18 to 20. I will raise up for them Israel a prophet like you from among their brothers. I will put my words in his mouth and he will tell him everything I commanded him. If any anyone does not listen to my words that the prophet speaks in my name, I myself will call him to account. But a prophet who presumes to speak in my name, anything I have not commanded him to say, or a prophet who speaks in the name of other gods, must be put to death. <clears throat> Think I follow that now? <clears throat> in its most essential form, prophecy is a vehicle of revelation. Revelation is a communication of God's word to man. New revelation. The people of God, having been redeemed from slavery, were brought to God at Sinai to receive not the words of a man, but the word of God. And yet, because of the awesome presence of God, <clears throat> the people asked for a mediator. <clears throat> a request that God was pleased to grant. Thus, the thunderous voice of God, the lightning, the fire, the smoke, the earthquake, and the peal of the trumpet were all replaced by the voice of a single Israelite speaking among his brothers. And yet, <clears throat> this single voice was understood to be nothing less than the word of God. This is the essence of revelation, and this is the essence of prophecy. <clears throat> Exodus 24, 7. Let me show you this from another passage, Exodus 24. In Exodus 24, we read of the actual account of God's people at Sinai, when Moses, going in the place of all the people, returned from speaking with God and conveyed the word of the Lord to God's people, as we read in verse 7, Then he took the book of the covenant and read it to the people. They responded, We will do everything the Lord has said. We will obey. So the nature of prophecy is one and the same as revelation, the communication of a word from God. What were the, uh, the uh, ramifications? To disobey prophecy was to disobey God. Remember Deuteronomy 18, 18 to 20. If anyone does not listen to my words, that the prophet speaks in my name, I myself will call him to account. But a prophet who presumes to speak in my name anything I have not commanded him to say, or a prophet who speaks in the name of other gods must be put to death. Pretty serious stuff. Because of the nature of biblical prophecy, that is the giving of God's word. To not obey the prophetic word was to disobey God. To disobey God's word was at the risk of judgment. This also would be the case for the prophet who exercised the gift flippantly or deceptively or in evil fashion to misuse prophecy was blasphemous and worthy of death. So brothers and sisters in the, in the Bible, the gift of prophecy stands for nothing less than a vehicle of revelation. To misuse the gift is to suffer the same consequences as blasphemy, which was death. Conclusion. Prophecy is a vehicle of God's revelation containing foretelling and forthtelling. When we look at the gift of prophecy, we discover that from the very beginning, prophecy was and is a vehicle of revelation, or in English, the communication of God's word. This cannot be too strongly emphasized to affirm that biblical prophecy contains in either of its basic forms foretelling or forthtelling. When anyone expresses belief that revelation continues, or that the word of God is not complete, or that there is still something that can be added to scripture, is to deny the truth. Oftentimes you hear it stated the biblical gift of prophesying is nothing more than preaching. In fact, I have even said this from time to time as pastor. Yet, upon my study of God's word, I retract those statements. O. Palmer Robertson wrote, While a contemporary preacher may be prophetic in his pulpit ministry, he is not prophesying in the biblical sense. Now, having mentioned the possibility of the misuse of the gift, God qualifies the gift of prophecy from which we conclude something about its standard. A. Prophecy is 100% accurate. 
no prophecy from God will go unfulfilled. 